Awesome. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are. Thanks for coming out to the second monthly Learn and Grow series. Today we are going to be talking about um, coordination. <laughs> I put the wrong title in Discord, but that's okay. <laughs> um, you can the mind with somewhere else, I guess. And uh, within coordination, we'll be breaking it down into a couple of different segments for a more focalized conversation. We will be talking about onboarding, the second piece with alignment, uh, which includes communication. It's, it's hard to coordinate if we're not communicating, um, even if that is asynchronously. And last but not least, a most often overlooked piece in DAOs, offboarding. Boarding is a critical piece of coordination and one that um, I don't think historically we've put much thought into in DAOs. It's definitely something that's uh, becoming a hot button. I am Coach Viking uh, from the Polygon Ecosystem DAO here, and I got my special uh, co-host, Lion, here from Bankless DAO. What's going on, Lion? Hey, guys. Hey, guys. What's up? So nice to meet you uh, again. Uh, this month, and I think the response to our last month's uh, recording was quite good. So, you know, happy to be here. And, and yeah, uh, let's discuss coordination. I think that's very, very important uh, in terms of, uh, you know, any like setting up the DAO culture. I think coordination is really the second most important thing after like culture. So, yeah, I think last last time we discussed culture. So, yeah, <laughs> on now let's discuss coordination. Yeah, absolutely. The last one was on culture, and it, it is a good segue. Uh, the way that I tend to view an onboarding practice is that is the first step of our uh, team alignment, right? That's where we can share like mission, vision, values, the guidelines, expectations, and just really, I don't think it's appropriate to get too thick into the weeds on things there and too technical. Um, but at least having general high level information that people can touch and go and, and find their way around quickly. It's, I think that's key. What about you, Glad? Yeah. So I think before, uh, like in terms of, uh, going to our each subheading, right? Let's just think of like how like coordination works in the DAO setting. So I think coordination, like we are, I think if we are an active contributor in the web three space, and if you would like to, you know, in general, uh, I mean, see how a normal, you know, person like us working with DAOs work is that essentially people are working in, you know, two, three DAOs. They have uh, roles in at least two DAOs and then they are somewhat doing similar role in multiple DAOs, right? So coordination is happening on two levels. Coordination is happening when they are doing a task and, you know, and obviously that task requires work and requires a team and they're coordinating amongst each other. Second level coordination happens is when you are coordinating within your work, like on a personal level within different DAOs. And obviously, you know, Coach Viking is a like he's like the best at DAO relationship. So he can speak about like what like what level of coordination he operates in. Because uh, you know, I have a legal background. So I mean, in terms of like my coordination, the deliverable I has is really the information that I'm provided and the agreement or research that I do. So it is still uh, quite, you know, a personal job, like in terms of one man job, but especially people working in, you know, community management and stuff like that. Coordination can be a huge, huge, uh, you know, hiccup. What do you think, Coach Viking? Yeah, it can. And I would even suggest that there's a few extra levels of coordination in there, right? Uh, the first level of coordination that we have is personal accountability, personal coordination. How are we as individuals managing our time, managing our calendar, keeping up to our commitments? If we cannot coordinate ourselves, it's going to be very hard to accomplish much of anything. Um, next, I would suggest we have the team or the DAO level coordination. Uh, and then on top of that, I would suggest there's there's a third level of coordination, and that would be 
um, like uh, cross DAO coordination, right? Um, traditionally, corporations, it's a dog eat dog world. There's not a lot of collaboration um, and everything is very closely guarded. What we're seeing here in DAOs uh, is, is pretty much the adverse of that. A lot of people back here, they're tired of um, extreme competition. They're tired of being stepped over or doing the stepping over. And partner, like partnerships and collaborations are front and center. Um, it is, it's a totally different, it's three different ballgames, right? Um, what we need to coordinate ourselves on an individual level isn't necessarily going to work on a DAO-wide level. And what works on a DAO-wide level, I'd suggest, isn't necessarily going to work when you have multiple organizations uh, working together. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I think now that we have defined, you know, that coordination can be of different types and, uh, you know, stuff like that, I think then we can move to the subheadings, you know. Now, let's, like, uh, I would like to speak about onboarding, right? Because, I mean, I am involved in a couple of DAOs which are, you know, like, doing things from the start. So onboarding re really, really becomes key to, uh, you know, anything uh, that really any future projects that they want to do, because if you don't onboard the right talent, I mean, you know, you're pretty much doomed from the beginning. So with respect to onboarding, I think, I think in terms of there are three, uh, like three major type of contributors that exist in any DAO. All right. And an onboarding process uh, or, or like an offboarding process or team alignment communication. Everything has to serve all those three type of contributors to get the maximum out of the DAO. Number one, a contributor is someone who's just lurking, someone who's part of, uh, you know, just join servers, uh, who's really not that interested in individual projects, but maybe saw a website, you know, maybe saw a medium post, you know, got interested and joined the DAO. And, you know, and so we need a bespoke process where essentially, while not annoying a new joiner, we're able to attract them slowly towards uh, the DAO, right? That's what happened with me with Ox Polygon ecosystem, right? I've been here for a couple of months. Then uh, you contacted me for something and I was like, okay, why, why don't we do this podcast? And then like a couple of weeks back, you know, I was, now I'm in talks with like to take up more responsibility. So now that is one kind of a contributor, right? Number two contributor is that these are people who essentially have like full-time jobs and maybe, you know, want to uh, be part of a community or maybe make a little extra income. And these are the people that generally don't work with like four or five DAOs. These are people who are working with one or two DAOs max. And, you know, just, just basically want an evening gig or a weekend gig. And like their onboarding is different, right? Because these are the people who actually do a lot of, a lot of tier two work in terms of, uh, you know, handling the pressure, like content production. And, you know, because these are the people who actually apply for bounties and Number three contributors are the contributors basically who work in DAOs full time and, you know, and uh, rely on uh, like money from DAOs to actually make a living. Actually, you will find it interesting, but from a DAO perspective, these are the people that you need to concentrate the least on, right? Because if you think about it, these are the people who really want the work. <laughs> so, you know, they will go to then they will do everything to understand about a DAO. But actually the trick trick is to convert the first kind of contributor into a regular contributor and the second kind of contributor like in terms of we need to make that contributor a regular so that that contributor doesn't go away uh so yeah coach what do you think what about this classification do you agree i think that's um yeah definitely the way that i tend to think of that is um we've got three different lanes right We've got our slow lane, our, our middle lane, and our fast lane. In the slow lane, um, that would be line, um, what I would correlate to contributors, right? They're the people like, yeah, they, they found micro, either long form or micro content somewhere. They're curious. They're wanting to check things out, um, maybe dip their toe in a little bit or, or just hang out in, in the community. Um, in the middle lane, that would be more like the part-time contributors or the hobbyists, the people who are coming in, they're, they're looking to pick up that extra work. And then in the fast lane, um, that's where you have the people who are like 
all in it's their their full time now and and they don't know any other way of being i wouldn't go so far as to say that excuse me one is more important than the other i, I would agree that the process that we have in between and our ability to meet each individual contributor or potential contributor where they are and guide them through that process to find which lane they're in um that's key and that's quite a challenge in in any DAO because there's there's only so much material you can give before things get overwhelming to segregate um to like up separate those audiences and where they need to be I think yeah. uh, something interesting too with that is that you have that that blend between your second and third uh, type of person where you have someone who may in one area of a DAO be a role holder and have a lot of responsibility, but in another DAO or in that same DAO have just project oriented work. And, and it still yeah. fits into the mindset, like you were saying, of people who are full time DAO are going to figure out ways to contribute um all over the place and in some cases that might mean some kind of a salaried position and in other cases you're hunting for work along the skills that you have yeah so it's really enough. about turning that first kind of lurker into either one of those three people <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think yeah i think now that you know we have understood the like the needs and goals of onboarding i think one thing I would really like to focus on training and then maybe we can move towards tooling as well, right? I mean, so, okay, so there are two ways to go about it. Either you can prepare a nice, you know, like a lot of material, like a good book and then, you know, and then have like a very nice discord where essentially people can, you know, figure out a lot of things, have a role select, have, a, have everything. And then, you know, people coming in and then you have onboarding calls and explain them everything. And... Uh, so that's one way to go about it. But the second way to go about onboarding, like in terms of training people, which I frankly think is the most effective and it's slightly controversial, so feel free to disagree, is actually have a funded project where people can come in, you know, they can get work and they do the work and they submit. You know, and in the process of doing that work and figuring that out, a lot of times they will figure out the DAO themselves because they will understand the incentives, they will understand why that work is happening and in that process they will understand the DAO and that's actually the great way right like if, if you know that someone in like who has come in in the first day and that person is ready to work then half the battle is won because now all you have to do is create a friendlier environment where essentially that person can DM anyone and gets a response and yeah and then basically you need to make less effort on training because basically what I see today with DAOs is that Training has become like a separate activity on itself, like like as important as probably, you know, may, maybe even tokenomics or having like a legal guild. And I don't think so that's feasible in the long run, right? I mean, because I don't think so that's the most effective thing because that has been my journey at Bankless. Uh, I was brought in to actually write a section for a report, all right? And it took me probably a week or two to write that. I started attending meetings and I realized, hmm, there is something here, you know? There is ability to have a community of friends and also maybe like make a little money on site. I was like, okay, wow, why is this? Why is this like that? You know, it took me, it took me two months to realize the difference between Bankless HQ and Bankless DAO. And then I realized, oh, most most uh, DAOs are like that, where essentially they function separately than their parent organization. You know, so the point is that <clears throat> uh, we are spending a lot of time onboarding people. And like, think of yourself, right? If someone asks you to join a DAO, will they actually spend time reading, you know, endless channels, endless, uh, uh, you know, your git book, your notion pages, because I don't think so. I will on the first go, I will never do that. Like there has to be an incentive to do that because in crypto, like a lot of people say there's dearth of content, but I would say there is quite a bit of content, you know, like if you just want to figure out like, because. I have done probably three to four podcasts where either I've explained what is NFT or I have explained, uh, you know, what is crypto and we still do that. But the point is that if someone really wants to understand that they would, you know, just Google it because like from wall street journal to <laughs> journal to your local, you know, newspaper, everyone has done that. But I think the beauty is that if you give them a project, which is aligned with certain, uh, you know, goals and you tell them, okay, look, there is monetary incentive in that. 
I think people are very easily, you know, motivated. And once they're motivated, yeah, then, you know, obviously you can, uh, like, ask them to, hey, to actually finish up this project, you need to attend this call. And they're where you can explain things. But I would say, like, the best method of training is actually not explaining them things or spoon feeding. Is actually onboarding people for a sep- uh, like a specific project where people are actually interested. I, I do agree with a lot of what you said. I do think that it is a lot easier in theory than more simple in theory than, than in practice. Um, definitely not easy. Simple, not easy. There's like there's it's kind of like a chicken and the egg problem that that we're seeing here, right? Um, and there's almost like there's two camps of people, and neither is right or wrong or or any better or worse off than the other. That I, I do think there's a place for both. Um, I like I'm the same as you, Lion. I like touch and go resources. If, you're, if somebody's going to bury me with info, there's a good chance that I'm not going to go through it. Um, if I need info, I will find it on my own, and I will look for quality, reputable resources. And that's there, there's a plethora of information available on the Internet. Yes, the quality information is not available um, and or easy to find, and that's really what had attracted me to Bankless in the early days. Now, most DAOs that I have come across um, operate on a proof-of-work system. We, every, we're all volunteers. You could be volunteering for two or three weeks. You could be volunteering for six months. How long somebody is volunteering before they may or may not get a paid position is totally on them and how much they're putting in anywhere. Um, and getting that proof-of-work before hiring or bringing somebody onto a team is critical. Now, I think that's historically how DAOs have operated. And um, Bankless is a prime example. Here at Polygon, we are struggling that with a little bit too. Without having incentive structures on the table, what motivation do people have? Right? Um, Asking people to volunteer and when they have bills and mortgages and, and families and stuff like that to feed for an undetermined amount of time to earn their stripes and um, be comfortable with their work and their consistency in what they're doing, uh, that doesn't always fly. I mean, it, it took me it took me three months. Um, it, it took me three to six months before I actually realized that I was like full time down and, and picking up work and stuff like that. Um, just because of how things are comp and done. Uh, finding salaries, I mean, salaries are, are few and far between. We, we've got a lot of um, younger, more startup um, phase DAOs or, or like pre-seed stage DAOs that um, have gone out of their way to acquire funding and do different things to pay people salaries. Um, and what we're seeing in those DAOs is people will call it to get a salaried position. As soon as they get that salaried position, they go ghost or take their foot off the gas. And, and that's that. Um, there, there's merits in both approaches, but they, they both have their drawbacks as well. But I find human nature, people set their eyes on a target. Once they get that trophy, that's it, they're done. They've, they've got their name, they've got their title, they've got whatever they set out to do. And then they just stop. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to go about doing it. There's, it's the trick is finding which personalities fit into which um, lanes and, um, helping them get comfortable where they need to be. Yeah. I mean, that's true. I mean, and obviously like going a little off topic here, you know, I mean, I would suggest that a lot of like, like, uh, I mean, a lot of web three companies, they want to build a DAO or like a community, but they still want to handle the product themselves, <laughs> which I find very silly, right? Because I mean, how can you build a community if they have nothing to do? I mean, they want 
like 200 active people on their discord but you'll have to give them something to do and you have to then start uh, you know like ideally be prepared that within 24 months your product should be able to be run by a DAO and that's very important right I mean you like uh, I've seen like a lot of web3 companies just for the clout they have a discord which has like 5000 members but only like 20 active contributors and you know and most of the time they are even paid uh, you know not in a DAO structure but on a salary structure but which I don't understand you know what like what's What's the motivation behind it besides the fact that they can write in their investor presentation that, hey, we are a truly Web3 company. We are building crypto tools, but we are also Web3. So, yeah, I, I think I think that's definitely there. But yeah, so moving on to tooling, you know, coach, I recently had an interesting tweet that, OK, like like basically because Discord organization is basically what coordination is all about, like how to have the most effective Discord structure that really incentivizes the contributors. So I would like to understand, like, what do you think? Like, what do you think are the best DAO tools? Like, I know you work with a lot of DAOs and there are a few DAOs where you're working at the, like, like from the beginning. So, like, what are the essential DAO tools that you think are important for good coordination? So, and then obviously I can add in, I can give you a few examples. So, I mean, okay, so you... To, for uh, figure out bounties, D work is there. Uh, recording meetings, a bot like a tool would be Craigbot. Uh, calendar would be Seshbot. Uh, coach, uh, wh what other tools do you think are good? You know, tooling is a major contention point for me in every single DAO that I operate. Um, I would say that without, well, I would suggest that without personal coordination the rest of it doesn't matter uh, and we can have all of the best tooling in the world we can tee everything up on a silver platter if somebody does not know how to manage their own calendar their own personal calendar it's pointless um and i see a lot of that in DAPS. um i see that here in polygon and i see that in everywhere else that i operate um people the the calendar bot the sesh bot people think it's too much work to manually enter things into their own calendar so they can be on time for calls um and when you're using sesh yes you can export every yeah you can export sesh to your google or your apple calendar but you have a hundred percent of the meetings going on within that DAO in your calendar um, if you're like myself or somebody like Lion who's in professional services, you have now overfilled your calendar to the point that your clients can no longer schedule appointments with you because you just uploaded a whole house calendar into your, in, into your thing. So I would suggest that the strongest piece of coordination for anybody is to learn how to self-manage, learn how to operate your own calendar, um, get comfortable taking those five seconds it takes to manually enter something in so you can be on time. Um, for DAO tooling, I don't think Discord is great DAO tooling. Unfortunately, there's no better solutions out there. Um, I know in the majority of DAOs that I'm in, we are actively looking for solutions to replace Discord. Um, Polygon, we've been pretty adamant here that we are not going to use Discord forever. And as soon as we find a solution, we're gone. <laughs> That's it. Bye bye, Discord. See you later. Um, but for now, Discord is all we really, it is the primary tool that we have um, for building a community and coordinating. Tribe.so, I think, is a good alternative. Um, it's more of like a Facebook, LinkedIn UI, but you can, or Mighty Networks as well, uh, Mighty Networks or Tribe is good in that you can set up focalized groups and make them private. So within the context of a DAO, each project could have its own private group, private area for discussions and stuff. Um, and you only see what you have access to, right? If it's private, you can apply for access and it's up to an admin or mod to grant it to you. Um, if that's where you're supposed to be. But having that level of customization is key. Um, we kind of have that in Discord, but we are all accustomed to how much things break. 
Um, Sesh is Sesh is great as like a source of truth, but that only goes so far as people actually removing stuff out of there into their personal calendars. Um, Carlbot is a very handy tool for DAOs. You can use Carlbot to restrict the server. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds. All we're really doing is blocking out noise. Um, so like legal teams might have sensitive information that they don't want everybody seeing. Discord isn't the best place for that, but you can set something up, make it private so that only legal people have access to it. Um, and if people are interested in legal, they can grab the tag. If they're not, they don't even know it exists. They don't even know the area exists. So there's a lot less noise pollution coming at them through Discord. Um, and then some sort of documentation for a source of truth. Um, I say it all the time. Notion is not it. Notion is made for, for private Web2 companies. Uh, any white hack, any hacker, white hat or otherwise that knows what they're doing that has permission in Notion um, can hack their ways to admin access and delete the whole workstation. So all it takes is one disgruntled, one disgruntled um, team member to go through and nuke all of your organization's documentation, um, provided that they have a basic level of, of hacking. Um, I'm not a big fan of Notion. It's not user friendly at all either. Uh, there are tools like Clarity and BIP and I like Epic Web3 tooling coming out that offer token gating or like NFT gating and different things. Um, they don't offer like tables and spreadsheets and stuff, which is okay. That as the technology evolved, and the service providers get more feedback from users, um, all, of, all of the new tooling that's coming out to support DAOs is going to be a hockey stick, a growth curve for sure. Um, and staying innovative and, and looking for these other solutions, um, that's key. Is I, I, I don't know one DAO that thinks that Discord is it, and I don't know one DAO that thinks that Notion is it. Um, the only the only people I hear actually vouching for those are like Web two executive type people um, that they they just don't know many other systems and, and they're not familiar familiar with like Web three ethos and, and different things. Um, kind of long winded, but that's what I got there. I don't know what you've experienced, line. No, no. I think look, I I think you're right. Uh, there is. And also, like, there is no right answers also. Sometimes, you know, like, sometimes some tools just work for a DAO, you know. And also, it depends on the size. I think size is a huge factor when it comes to tooling. You know, I remember, like, <laughs> I work, like, I work in a group where, like, there are literally just four members who are, like, like, even though there are, like, seven, eight bounties, but, like, there are only, like, you know, four members who are really active. And... Uh, now, obviously, we need a system. Like, it's great that we have that tool. You know, in the future, that, like, for example, yeah, I'm talking about Dwork. Like, D like, it's amazing in terms of bounties. But when there are only three, four people, you know, in a dot doesn't make sense. But Dwork makes a lot of sense if you have like twenty five hundred active contributors. So yeah, and I think DAO tooling is like tooling. Actually, like people won't believe it, but you know. It, it's so important in terms of like certain important decisions sometimes can go wrong in terms of tooling, like selecting the right tool and especially at the beginning and then getting them changed at the end is just so annoying. Like, like frankly, Discord reorganization, right? I mean, I'm in charge of that in Mandao. So that oh, technically has now a lot of active members. So now to actually change the whole Discord structure is just so hard. It's just so hard. And that's only because at the beginning, you know, like people were not smart about a lot of decisions. So yeah, I mean, if you're building a DAO or if you're in Web3, please, please be very, very careful with like DAO tooling and everything. And just don't start building your own, right? I mean, just look at a few successful DAOs that you're part of. Look how their, uh, you know, standards were built and then go about it. So yeah, I think let's let's move on to team alignment and, uh, you know, how, how how's that, coach? team alignment, communication, and all of that? 
Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. Like team alignment is absolutely critical, right? And it, it wherever you are within an organization, that alignment is key. Uh, from a leadership perspective, if we aren't communicating our messaging and our asks accordingly, um, we're not going to be having our contributors. Our contributors won't buy into what we're wanting to do. If they're not buying into what we want to do, they're just not going to do it, right? And it, it works the same from uh, uh, on a community-first approach. Um, if the community wants to do something and they're not communicating well to leadership, well, the leadership isn't, or governance team, and they're going to really be too inclined to actually, actually like execute on ideas. How we are communicating and how we are portraying information is absolutely critical. And um, even with like Discord organization and stuff, I mean, I, I just spent the morning this morning <laughs> reorganizing Polygon's Discord here, um, setting up role gating and, and the whole nine yards. I deleted like 50% of our channels. Um, it's been a mad, it's, it was a massive facelift. And like even simple things like how we're organizing our workflows or our documentation, it goes a long way to create that culture of buy-in and camaraderie that we need for, for team alignment. Um, and that team alignment is created right from the very beginning when you're defining your culture. It carries on through onboarding. It carries all through operations. And it doesn't end until somebody's actually been offboarded out of the community. Yeah. No, that's true. That's definitely true, right? I mean, uh, there are a couple of, like, again, like, if, if I have just have to list, uh, like, like in some important uh, points with regard to team alignment, I think, okay, number one would be, especially in a DAO space, it would, like, team is aligned based on your culture. So, you know, even if someone doesn't work or someone doesn't know what the exact, actually the DAO does, I mean, the first thing that really, really impacts, uh, you know, the team is the culture that is set up in the DAO wide, like, like culture is something that is actually going for bankless, you know, like even, even in the space where there, you know, like coin price falls 60, 70%, 80%. I mean, if the fact is that people are still ready to contribute, it's really due to the culture. It's really for the love of the place that people are working at. Similarly, I think the second most important thing is having a leader. You know, as much we want things to be decentralized and, you know, slightly more controversial here. But sometimes some groups, they need an anchor. They need someone who will reach out to you. They will need someone who will DM you, who will, you know, speak to you, who will guide you, who will help you out that, oh, hey, I'm unable to export, uh, you know, USDC from Metamask. Can you help? You know, just like having that one anchor point within your team is very important for coordination purposes. You know, because uh, like uh, it, it doesn't matter like how high paid the, like, you know, the, a project is. If you don't have those one or two people who are willing to, you know, just go at it and just, uh, yeah, it's just going to be very hard to align your team. Number three, uh, which... Could have been first as well, but I would put it as three is the vision, the vision of the DAO. Like, like bankless, right? I mean, our vision is to have like, you know, like a billion people go bankless. That's a pretty strong vision. And that that can be seen in any, you know, in any scenario. That That's very, very important. And probably the fourth and last thing that could probably is both uh, like a uh, team, like how a team is aligned and also a very big part of culture as well is actually to get out of the scarcity mindset. Because if your team doesn't believe that, oh, we have enough resources to get things done. I mean, obviously, if you have too much resources, then it can lead to opposite effects. But if the team constantly feels that, you know, the resources are enough, it's just very hard to align people because, because most projects will not lead to billion dollar companies where we can ask people to, hey, you know, it's fine if you spend extra time right now and, you know, later it will paid off. It will be paid off. But I think you need to get out of the scarcity mindset if you are building a team. You need to tell the people that, hey, I know you're working hard. Don't worry, you'll be compensated well. And I think that's very, very important. Uh, because 
otherwise you otherwise if you are always conveyed to your team that look the resources are, are scarce you know they're just going to be uh, i don't know like i don't think so they will perform at the optimum level for a long period of time and uh, yeah th- th- that's certainly very important and like i said right weekly meetings are very important to realign realign your team with uh, you know a lot of stuff but also you have spoken about uh, communication you know coach and i had a very big important question how do you think like how how like do you feel that sometimes there are just a lot of meetings that are done in dao space which are really not required which can be done over simple text or do you sometimes feel you know yeah like like for some things meetings are very important but i always feel that you know we would work a lot better if we just have like probably 30 40% of the meetings or we have and i think that's better for communication because a lot of things that are discussed in meetings are not put on paper but on text they are always there and fairly clear also sometimes uh yeah <laughs> oh man anybody who's been around me a lot knows that that's a, that's that's a major trigger point for me um I'll, I'll i'll back i'll digress i'll, I'll backtrack a little bit um though um hone in there's a couple differentiate differentiations i'd like to make um and i think bankless is a prime example of this the being in love or bought into an organization is not enough for a long term viability um of a contributors contributions uh, bankless is seeing that right now a lot of people who were around from day one they're still very much in volunteer status and there's a lot of leadership that has stepped down quit walk away or, or done a lot um is like at the end of the day everybody still has mortgages and bills to pay um volunteering and doing something just because you you're bought into an organization or whatever it's not enough to keep people going long term um they need to see light at the end of the tunnel um and i i I'll speak for myself and that that's why i left um and stepped down from all my positions is because that light wasn't there the the onboarding and numbers are constantly going up and pay is not which is causing pay to go down um eventually there's a tipping point where people say enough is enough and they walk away there's a lot of pushback around treating a dao like a business at the end of the day a dao is a business if there is no revenue the business cannot support itself there are no legs to the table which means that the community and nobody's going to be around very long because there's no incentives to keep them around um like uh, there's a lot of people like there's a lot of people in the world who are in a position where they could volunteer their lives away and they would be okay um the the harsh reality is for for most of us on this planet uh, that's not obtainable anytime soon um and a lot of the people who want to be in this space they are looking for some sort of consistency some sort of paycheck some sort of something to put them here in a more permanent capacity um and 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 keep them here um so yeah i i just want to push back on that a little bit there's merit in both both approaches but um sorry what was your question on communication line <laughs> i i was saying why are there why do we have so much so many meetings you know sometimes <laughs> oh yeah trigger that that's my trigger um the, yeah, the yeah, solution yeah. most people default to hey let's have a meeting right that that is that is most people's default answer to anything hey let's have a meeting hey let's have another call well when you're working in one or two dows you don't really notice it but we are inundated with calls like um my said like i it's not just me but most people i talk to who operate in multiple dows were on calls for 12 hours a day back to back calls there is zero room for productivity we cannot get any work done because we're sitting on calls all day um and the more you're involved in the more this stuff keeps piling on i agree with you like more calls is not the answer 
99% of the time when people want to hop on a call, it could have been solved over an email or within a couple written notes. That 30, 60 minutes that it took to go over something with somebody, um, the majority of that is like dead space. It's not productive time. It's chatting about whatever, right? There's, there's not a lot of focus. Um, I'm not a big fan of calls, and I'm not a big fan of relying on calls for solutions. Um, asynchronous systems are the way to go to limit calls. And it could be as simple as having a wiki page full of updates. You're on shift and your other team members are not. Um, go to a document and write down any updates that need to be passed around to get everybody on the team um, used to looking at wherever that's being documented for those async updates. Um, using tooling like Clarity or a Word doc, um, a Google Doc or, or whatever, um, these things can we can we can accomplish a lot, and you don't actually need a meeting. Um, meetings are very corporate; they're very web too. Um, sitting in weekly meetings that don't accomplish anything just for the sake of having that meeting to see everybody, it's it's not productive. Yeah, I mean, I am a firm believer that any meeting that exceeds 20 minutes actually becomes a brainstorming session. <laughs> because any any important news that needs to be dispersed can be done in 20 minutes. You know, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, I think I think this is a important aspect. And I think, yeah, I think most of us will agree with it. But, you know, I think most of us are both victims and enablers of this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, all right, I think, okay, this is also something that I find interesting, but I really didn't understand the whole aspect of it. So maybe you can cover this. Like, what do you mean by offboarding? Like, like, what does it entail in a DAO? Because what I would think is that if someone is on our project and that guy stops working, I mean, it's fine. That guy or girl, you know, like they just get excluded from that project slowly and steadily. But it's not like we can ask them to, you know, like go out of the DAO or a server. So what do you mean by offboarding, coach? Well, there are a number of different onboarding is broad. <laughs> I'll give it that. And I will go back to what I said a bit ago. A DAO is a business, right? How we hire people is equally as important as how we let people go. If somebody is not performing their job, a DAO is a business. We have every right to fire them, to offboard them. See you later. Um, if somebody got hired for a job and they're not doing the job, yes, it is that simple. Um, if they're on a if they're on a payroll, um, a true DAO, a peer DAO, where it is fully decentralized and operating on chain, um, don't necessarily don't really have that um, availability, right? Um, somewhere like Polygon, where it's centralized, we do have the ability to let people go for non-performance. Um, but the other side of offboarding, like you have your, you, you have your organizational sides of onboarding or offboarding, um, which includes personal team and DAO, right? Just because somebody needs to get offboarded or let go from a team does not necessarily mean that they're not a bad fit for the DAO. Um, they, they can go try on another team or another area. That's fine. Um, but in the case, like community standards, um, community guidelines, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. If somebody is toxic, if they're not following the community guidelines, um, if they're sexually harassing people, if they're being violent, um, like negative, um, Hey, cancer spreads fast. You got to cut that out of your organization and you got to let them go. It's, I know people don't like hearing about this in the doubt space, but we have to. And then the other side of offboarding is personal offboarding, right? And anybody who's worked with me knows that I am pro at offboarding myself everywhere. And I am pro at onboarding myself. Here at the Polygon ecosystem, how I've tried my hand on every single team and left every single team except community managers um, is because it wasn't my jam. It had nothing to do with the people. 
it was I threw myself in a situation to try and learn new skill sets. I felt I was holding the team back too much by needing to, um, by being too far behind on, on what was needed to, to do a good job. So I, I respectfully offboarded myself out of, out of the teams um, just to make sure that I have capacity to be here as a lead community manager and, and doing my, my, fulfilling my duties within the community. Um, but that, that personal offboarding is just as important as the organizational offboarding. Got it. Got it. Yeah, coach. I mean, you know, when you talk, talked about offboarding, so yeah, basically, uh, detaching yourself from projects. I think that's, that's a very important thing because I am actually like really struggling with a couple of contributors in a DAO who really don't add value and the thing is like, okay, so I want to explore this important topic, right? Getting emotionally attached to the work you do. A lot of times uh, in DAOs, what I've seen is that, you know, and this is especially people who are young and, you know, who haven't worked in like any kind of structure before, that they get emotionally attached to their work. Like if you ask them to, for example, you know, prepare a table or, you know, work on a document and then they do that work, they will fight tooth and nail not to actually defend the principle, but just defend the fact that they have spent three hours on it and yeah, it's a, it's, it's like, it's work done. It creates a couple of issues, right? Number one, I mean, you are spending a lot more than three hours, uh, that you had originally spent on that work, actually defending it. Number two, you're pissing a lot of, a lot of people, you know, and like it or not, DAOs are a game of likability, you know, I mean, if someone is asking you to make changes and until and unless it generally doesn't impact your work in a drastic sense i believe personally that you should be able you should just do it you know and number three i think it just creates a toxic culture where people get territorial about their work i understand if they want to take ownership of their work but they get territorial and i think if someone is getting too emotionally attached to their work and to the level where it creates a hurdle for other contributors to come in and give them feedback and get things done in a better way yeah, that, that becomes an issue, right? Because, I mean, that insecurity of the work that you have done is dangerous. It's one of the most dangerous things because, and I go through it every day, but, you know, I need to fight it. You know, like sometimes what happens is that, you know, I would spend like hours on a document or like on a task and someone will just come and tell me like a change in like 30 seconds. And, I, you know, my first reaction is obviously, and that's not just me, like that's natural, right? Hey, do you even know how much work I've done? Instead of doing that, you know, now I just do it instantly because A, I've made my life a lot easier because I'm not spending hours. It doesn't impact my work on a macro level or a micro level. It's fine. I mean, one or two changes are there. The other person is happy because they think I'm accommodating. So, I mean, coach, what is your opinion? Do you get emotionally attached to your work? Like, do you get insecure if someone comes in and suggests like a better or a different way? Because I do too, but I actually am trying to avoid it lately. And I think this should be a valid cause for off offboarding someone if they get emotionally attached or insecure about their work. Because in a decentralized setting, you know, I mean, everyone should be able to allow to, you know, to be, uh, should be allowed to contribute. I wouldn't go so far as to penalize anybody for being emotionally attached or vested into their work. Um, I am definitely guilty of being that guy that gets emotionally attached. Um, but I don't let it manifest in ways that represent perfectionism or toxic traits. Um, if I feel that, if I feel that I'm in over my head or whatever the case may be, I'm the first one to say I need help. <laughs> and probably it doesn't, any server that I'm in, it doesn't take much. To say. You can search up my name and there's probably once a day I say I, I need help somewhere um and ask and and really what that comes down to like you like you said line it's, it's a pop like DAOs are a popularity game um how we keep our commitments is going to impact that popularity keeping our commitments counts with ourselves if we cannot keep our commitments to ourselves to get up and go to the gym or do whatever the heck we said we were going to do you committed to completing a bounty on time for a job you committed to doing documentation, um, but those commitments aren't being kept, 
um, that that points to a much a much bigger problem, um, and, and that's where maybe on maybe offboarding is a solution. Maybe offboarding isn't the solution. Um, I would say it's it's highly situational and uh, and what's going on. But um, there's definitely a lot of different dynamics in play there, and I wouldn't necessarily uh, blanket it all into one generic statement. Um, quite often, people who are passionate and emotionally invested in their work, um, th they do very good um, because the, the team comes first. And when, you, when yeah. you put the team first and you do what you need to do to make sure the team is successful, um, everything just flows. Yeah, fair enough. No, you know, I think maybe I became a little more passionate about this point because I'm <laughs> struggling with like one or two particular <laughs> contributors who I'm really, really <laughs> annoyed with. But uh, no, no, I, I completely understand. Also, uh, yeah, but per this is, was very unique, you know, very mature of you to bring up personal offboarding because, yeah, I mean, for us to, you know, get out of situations where we know that we are becoming hurdles rather than, you know, supporters. Uh, yeah, that that that's an interesting thing. You know, we often feel that, uh, like getting fired is the only way to go out. <laughs> but yeah, we often don't explore it enough that, hey, maybe we can excuse ourselves from a project or two. So, yeah. People, that, that, yeah. it is very hard to bite the bullet, so to speak, and say I messed up and I jumped in over my head. Uh, traditionally, in default corporations, Yes, people generally look down on you and you may get fired for speaking out like that. In DAOs and Web3, that is huge. Uh, people look up to you and admire you so much for being willing to go out on that ledge, put yourself out there, whether it works or not. Even if you fall flat on your face, people respect that. And more often than not, most people watching you are on the sidelines wishing that they had the cojones to go out and do it themselves. And just seeing you make that effort is enough to inspire other people to maybe start engaging more, right? Um, it's, it's setting that example, setting the tone. Um, if we can't be honest with ourselves about how we're feeling and what's going on, we're not going to have that ability to be honest with our team or, or anybody else. Um, with that, we've got about six minutes left. Do we want to open up the stage for comments, questions or anything? Or what are we thinking? Yeah. Anyone interested in making a comment or speaking to us? Uh, I know Dave just DM'd me uh, saying that, uh, yeah. So if Dave would like to come in, uh, anyone, I, uh, you know. Hi, Tim. Good. It's evening here. Yeah. Good evening. Hey, Femi. How are you? I'm very fine. How about you? I'm doing well, thanks. What do you got? Okay. Okay. So um, I'm listening to the call, and I got to take note of when you said uh, we've been having calls and work has not been done, and it's the truth actually, we've been doing a lot of calls since the launch of EcoDAO and. I wanted asking when we work properly start. I come into the marketing aspect and also the community management aspect. So I want to know when we work actually starts. Is there like a work schedule to follow? What to do? And because I've been checking the pinned, the pinned um, section in the marketing and other this and I've not seen anything like something relevant to start for. So what's like the way forward? Yes, yeah, so Femi, um, that's outside of the scope of what we're talking about here. This is a, a learn and grow series. Uh, once we wrap up, I will get with you privately and um, I, I'll make sure you get with David Craig and the people who are leading the teams that you're interested in. And uh, that way you're getting put into the systems the right way out of the gate. Cool. Does that work for you? Works perfectly fine. Okay, cool. Uh, Derby, you're up next. I sent you an invite to come up. Oh, there you are. Hello. Hey, we can hear you. Yeah, fine. So, like, uh, Coach, uh, two months back, I implemented one strategy whereby in a DAO, 
if a small group is working, say four or five people are working continuously, rather than sending each other calendarly request and then, you know, each filling up which, uh, what, uh, which part of the day they are free for, you know, Discord call, this, that. I just came out with a strategy that will uh, will share each other's phone numbers itself directly so that we call each other. We text a message most of the time uh, over the WhatsApp itself. Only things that needs to be recorded or uh, we need evidence or something like that. Then we come to Discord and we type or we send uh, uh, what do you call files and all like we are not shadowy super coders so that uh, i mean where we have to hide our face our name and our identity and all we can you know share our uh, whatsapp number directly or else our phone number so for past th these two months things have been so easy and 90 percent of our workload has come down and we know each other pretty well and uh, you know things are very smooth so when it comes to communication, if it's a very small group, they can very well share their numbers and they can coordinate very easily rather than going through Discord and waiting for each other to accept calendarly requests, then coming to Discord, uh, I mean, Discord or Google Meet, then they are, you know, meeting for half an hour or one hour where things can be settled in just two minutes. So back to you. Yeah, definitely. Um, if people are comfortable sharing their personal phone numbers and stuff like that, um, WhatsApp or different digital messaging tools can be powerful. Um, and we didn't get into it today. Um, one of the points that we could have brought up in here on communication is Dowser International, right? We've, we've got people from all over the world. And when we're, when we're trying to schedule and coordinate calls and do all this stuff, I don't think it's reasonable to be asking people to be up at midnight, one, three, five in the morning, just to stay plugged in and in tune um, to be involved. So they, things like things like Slack or, or Discord messages, WhatsApp, um, all of that can be very powerful for um, different subsects of communication that need to happen on a team. With that, we got a couple minutes left. Ryan, do you want to have the honors of closing it out here, my friend? Uh, I think someone just joined. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, before. Yeah, let's give yeah. yeah, mm -hmm. Nav a chance here before he goes up. Yeah, hi. Just heard, uh, heard out, uh, heard out. I wanted to take your views on it. That how do you um, eventually view a DAO to be working? Like, does it have hierarchy? Is it a flat hierarchy? Or like, who allots tasks? Is there a salaried structure? So eventually, yeah. how do you view it to be working? Yeah. So, Anna, look. I think uh, I think I'll I'll give a two two layer uh, sec like two layer answer to this question, right? So number one would be like what is the like what is the purpose of a DAO? That every product will need to determine that, or a, any group of people coming together and forming it will have to figure that out, right? Because now what a lot of things that I have noticed is that everyone keeps saying you know uh, that uh, you know like they just discredit anything or everything that was happening in Web two. And, you know, they want to just reinvent the wheel in every way. But I personally think that that's not the right way, right? Because clearly, uh, we had spent thousands of years doing some things. And, you know, uh, and like we built built those processes. Uh, and then, you know, internet came along. We edited that a bit. Then Web2 came along. So clearly, if you can, uh, if you, can you know, figure that out in terms of, you know, like if, if the world has figured out so many things, maybe there is some merit there. So a lot of uh, days, you know, a lot of DAOs you will see, you know, they just discredit everything that's going on. Uh, that shouldn't happen, you know. Uh, with respect to, uh, with respect to, uh, you know, the needs of what a DAO does. For example, a lot of products that I see actually only need a community around them, you know. And they often uh, misplace that in terms of uh, creating like a DAO and then funding it and then realizing, oh, this DAO will never be profitable. Because if you just need a community for people to be excited about and chat with you, that's that like a normal Discord server is enough, you know. You don't need to have like roles and all of that. So now the DAO that you're talking about, I think is more from a business perspective that how do you see a business running through DAOs? I, I personally think, uh, and I might be wrong here, but it's slightly controversial again. I don't think so that DAO structures are well enough today, like at the moment where a product can be built from scratch 
where everything is decentralized where everyone on the discord server is like a different person who and everything was strategized in a decentralized manner you know i think most products today are built in a web2 setting and then once they become uh, you know get popular in the web2 space then you know one uh, says that oh i'm going to convert this product into a web3 management style product and that's that just is. it how it's going now in terms of how i see daos functioning look there will be some sort of hierarchy right most daos today also have like a level 1 level 2 contributors we have tags essentially where uh, things are like how things are made but i i actually don't think anav that if one is working with one dao there is going to be a lot of you know difference in terms of uh, the way things are done like they are done in a web2 company right so for example i personally believe that a c that the difference uh, between a salary that exists between a ceo or like a you know like a year one associate can be 100 times or even a thousand times sometimes i don't think that will ever happen in a dao because most people will make abnormal games gains only in uh, through their coin allocation but in terms of salary uh, i think it will be more equitable based on their skill and task so i mean that's brilliant right but i do think hierarchy will still exist because uh, i wish people were good enough that they would be accountable to the community but uh, hierarchies will <laughs> will still be there for people to you know follow up and everything the only way to actually beat that hierarchy system is to have regular elections for the tasks that are allotted so once one is appointed then if that task is up for elections every 3 months 4 months yes then hierarchy is not there because you are basically accountable to the community and the moment you are not working you know you are basically uh, like you are <laughs> basically you know voted off the community and actually that takes care of offboarding uh, like like, pro- or like you know automatically but that also creates the problem where everything then becomes a popularity contest uh, where uh, leaders will not be incentivized to take hard decisions because they know that if they take an unfavorable decision in the short run even if it's good for the long run yeah these guys will be voting voted out because like i i'll be very honest right like at bankless like my role that i have is up for re-election every 3 months so why it could it keeps me on my toes but it's slightly you know like scary as well right because i feel a little like scared that whether i can uh, rely on, on bankless for like a full time role always or not and that's good and maybe bad at the same time so yes yeah similarly like right now i don't think so a lot of uh, you know competition will be there for roles and everything because like the bank price has fallen but i remember when december when the bank price was quite high i mean each each guild had you know quite a bit of uh, you know competition like people nominating themselves for different roles so yeah hierarchy should exist but i i hope i wish i had the right answer but salary in like coming on to the salary i think we'll have to figure out a way to actually pay people in stable coins instead of the dao governance coin because i have noticed that if people are uh, you know relying on the governance ca- coin to actually pay their bills what happens is that the moment they get paid they directly sell it and that creates a constant selling pressure on the dao governance coin and uh, like so yeah i think stable coin salary is something that i would suggest uh, would be important for like important contributors and leaders then obviously bounty system should work but yeah because that's what i've seen at bankless like there is a constant selling pressure which is really driving the price down so i think in eventually if most dows want to you know uh, maintain a good healthy treasury yeah this is the way coach back to you yeah uh, driving the revenue to be able to support paying contributors in stable coins is key without having revenue and funding going into the treasury um there there's no stables or anything to pay people right it's your your funding is is going to run out in terms of hierarchy i know it's kind of a dirty word and and we're adverse to it back here at the end of the day hierarchy will always exist in one way shape or form or another um everybody wants to lead it's like it's like that old saying right everybody wants to lead until it's time to do leader stuff hey right? everybody wants to be a boss until it's time to do boss stuff place it with leader um it's the same thing like governance treasury management 
Um, let's, let's look at treasury management. Most people don't even like managing their own personal finances. What makes us think they're going to step up and participate in, in managing the money for an organization? Um, governance, right? Everybody, everybody wants to have a say in the rules, but asking them to sit down and define the rules, there's only 1% of people that are actually going to sit down to define the rules. The other 99 just want to say in it, but they don't want to actually do the work. Um, the people who are the ones that are doing the work, those, it doesn't matter. Like we, we can point it, label it, whatever we want. Um, those are always going to be the leaders. And um, humanity is always going to need people to take charge and step up and, and lead. Because uh, at the end of the day, the, the majority of people in the world, they just don't want to do it. Um, same as self-sovereignty, right? Um, a lot of us crypto natives, we know self-sovereignty is the way to go. We're looking around at world events. But at the end of the day, the, like a lot of people in the world, they just don't want to put in the effort to have to protect their wallet, um, manage their own funds, and do all these things. Um, so there's there's always going to be there's always going to be, I guess, power structures, for lack of a better word, hierarchies. Because um, people, people are always going to want to look to other people to do the things that they don't want to do. And those people that they look to are always going to be the leaders. Um, right now, as the geopolitical stage is getting more and more intense, your 99% of the population, the normies, are looking for more and more extreme leaders to combat the extreme um, geopolitics that they're seeing wherever they live. And the more extreme our society gets right now, um, with, with everything going on in the world, um, the more that the general population is going to be looking for these extreme leaders to be able to step in and give them their their order from the chaos. Um, so yeah, we I, I, it's it's a nice idea that we will live in a, a utopian leaderless society, but. It's humanity is just not cut out for it at the end of the day, that the human conditioning is going to take a long time to get people comfortable for any of that. All right, guys, I think I am time to close the call. We have already, yeah, uh, uh, like coach and I have been here since like uh, last, like one hour, 45, uh, 15 minutes. So. <laughs> Yeah. All right, well, don't forget to join us on Monday, March 21st at 7 p.m. UTC for the follow-up hangout conversation. Yeah. And thanks for coming. And, and to follow that up, our next Learn and Grow is on April 4th, and we will be discussing the importance of empathy within DAOs. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Anthony, I appreciate the, the recording and, and the, the jumping in. Lion, it was a good chatting as always, my friend. It was nice having you up here as well. And yep. thanks to everybody who participated on any level. Uh, we wouldn't be here doing this without y'all. So, um, yeah, we'll see y'all in a couple weeks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone.